ocean planet is a planet that consists, as you might have guessed, mainly of water, ice, and maybe some rocks. Think of the Earth's oceans. Its horrifying depths, the Mariana Trench, and all that. And now, can you guess how much space all the water on Earth takes up? 0.025%, exactly. Now, just try to imagine a world of 40-60% to 60% water. If you dive in there, the depth can exceed 60 miles. Compared to that, the 6-mile depth of our Mariana Trench sounds like nothing. And yeah, the pressure there will be enormous. It can reach up to 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Very crushing. Now, it may sound scary, but it still would be great to find out more about these planets. Fortunately, according to scientists' calculations, there may be a lot of such planets in our galaxy alone. Well, you don't have to go far. You can find these water guys even in our solar system. Not planets, of course, but moons. Jupiter has Ganymede and Callisto, and Saturn has Titan and Enceladus. The ocean can reach up to 30% of the mass of these moons. Although it isn't clear whether these oceans are covered with a thick crust of ice. But we've discovered quite a few full-fledged ocean planets. This is because the conditions in which these planets may exist are very specific. For example, this planet should be somewhere 6 to 8 times larger than the Earth. If it's smaller, it'll have a rocky surface. But if it's bigger, it'll turn into a gas giant. At the same time, it must be in the habitable zone of its star. A little further, and the planet immediately turns into an icy giant or a cold super-Earth. So yeah, these guys are very picky. We first started exploring these planets back in the 1970s. However, since then, we've found only a couple of them. But they're still very interesting. The first planet is Gliese 1214b. It was the very first ocean planet that we discovered. Initially, the scientists noticed only a small, dim dot. This dot turned out to be the red dwarf star Gliese 1214, an unremarkable, completely ordinary star that's five times smaller than our Sun and 300 times dimmer. Scientists wouldn't worry about it at all, but back in 2009, they noticed that this star had one single planet, and this planet turned out to be quite strange. This super-Earth was 2.5 times bigger than our Earth and 6.5 times heavier. But at the same time, it had a very, very small density and about the same gravity as our planet. In other words, there were almost no rocks and metals on it. But it wasn't a gas giant either. So there was only one option left. It was covered in water and ice. And that's how we discovered the first ocean planet. Well, actually, we can only assume that it consists of water. That's what the mathematical calculations say. In reality, this planet is quite confusing. It's difficult to explore, and so far, scientists haven't been able to find anything there. No hydrogen, no helium, no water, nada. That's because the outer layer of the atmosphere of this planet is very dense, and it perfectly hides its composition. But even so, it's probably a water world. Gliese 1214b is very close to its star. It's only 0.014 astronomical units away, which is less than the distance between the Moon and us. The year there lasts about 36 hours, and the temperatures, to put it mildly, are just wild. Scientists suggest that the average temperature there can reach 250 to 535 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo, that's hot! Remember the creepy description from the beginning? Well, actually, spending time on Gliese 1214b would be a little different. More like swimming in a steam boiler. Because of such gigantic temperatures, the ocean on the surface will be constantly in a state close to boiling without actually reaching it. So, imagine that you're descending to the surface of this planet, flying through clouds of steam. And then, you suddenly find yourself in the water. What? But when did it happen? Well, that's because the boundary between steam and water on Gliese 1214b will be very blurred. Of course, you won't be able to swim to the bottom of this ocean. But most likely, this bottom is covered with a very thick layer of so-called hot ice. It's like regular ice, but it doesn't really care about the laws of physics, so it just doesn't melt even at gigantic temperatures. And the thickness of this ice can reach as much as 3,000 miles. So that's it for the creepy Gliese 1214b. And not an Airbnb in sight! Now, although we can't 100% guarantee that it's a water world, 
we still have another candidate for this position. A newly discovered planet called TOI 1452b. This planet, located in the Dragon constellation, is almost 100 light years away from us. It was discovered using the TESS telescope by a group of researchers from the University of Montreal. This planet also belongs to the class of super-Earths. It's 7 times larger than our planet, but 48 times heavier. Again, all this is at a very low density. Because of this, scientists have suggested that almost the entire planet consists of a giant ocean. Here, we were a little luckier. This world won't be just a giant puddle and some thick ice. On this planet, there's probably a rocky surface deep under the water, just like in a typical ocean. Don't get too excited, though. This ocean will certainly be very different from what we're used to. When taking a picture on a sunny day, you'll probably use a short exposure, together with the narrow aperture setting on your camera. This way, just a short burst of light will get in. That's similar to how our pupils contract in sunlight so that they don't have to deal with too much light. And since it's just as bright up there in space, the process is the same when you take pictures of sunlit objects there. Using short exposure, you can get good, bright pictures of Earth or the surface of the Moon. But it also means there will be no stars in the picture. Even up there, stars are relatively dim. They don't emit enough light to show up in photos taken with such settings. Our home planet has a blue sky that slowly transforms into a beautiful orange-red palette at dusk and dawn. But if you ever get a chance to watch a sunset on Mars, you should expect the opposite, an orange-brown daytime sky that gets a bluish tint at sunset. First of all, Mars is farther away from the sun than our planet. So, when you're looking at the sun from the Martian surface, of course, it looks fainter and smaller. And not just that. The sun observed from Mars is just a bluish-white dot surrounded by a blue halo. The thin atmosphere of the red planet contains large dust particles. They create an effect called my scattering. It occurs when the diameter of particles in the atmosphere is almost the same as the wavelength of the scattered light. This effect filters out the red light from the sun's rays. So, only the blue light would reach your eyes on Mars. How come Earth doesn't have rings? All gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, have such rings, whereas the rocky planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars don't. There are two theories about how rings can appear around a planet. They might be just some material left from the times when the planet was forming, or they may be the remains of a moon that got destroyed by a collision with some space body, or torn apart by the strong gravitational pull of its parent planet. The gas giants formed in the outer regions of our solar system, while all the rocky planets are in the inner part. So maybe the inner planets were more protected from potential collisions that could have formed their rings. There are also more moons in the outer regions of our solar system, which could be another reason why the planets there have rings. Also, bigger planets have stronger gravity. It means that they can keep their rings stable after they form. Some experts believe Earth used to have a ring system a long time ago. A Mars-sized object might have collided with our home planet, which probably created a dense ring of debris around it. Some scientists think that this debris formed not a ring, but what we know today as the Moon. There's probably a giant planet lurking at the edge of the solar system, far beyond Neptune. Scientists call this mysterious hypothetical world Planet 9. If it does exist, it's probably similar to Uranus or Neptune, and 10 times more massive than our home planet. It's likely to circle around the Sun, but in the outer reaches of the solar system, about 20 times farther than Neptune. Another interesting theory says that Planet 9 could actually be a black hole the size of a grapefruit that warps space in a similar way a large planet would. Even though we once thought it was a rare substance in space, water exists all over our solar system. For example, you can often find it in asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on the Moon and Mercury. We still don't know if there's enough water to support potential human colonies if we decide to move there, but some amount of water is definitely present there. Mars has water at its poles, too. It's mostly hidden in the layers of ice and probably under the planet's dusty surface. Europa, Jupiter's moon, has some water, too. This is the most likely candidate we know about to host life outside Earth. 
there's probably a whole ocean of liquid water under its frozen surface. It might actually contain twice as much water as all of Earth's oceans combined. Neptune is unexpectedly warm. Even though it's 30 times as far from the Sun as our planet and receives less sunlight and heat, but it still radiates way more heat than it gets. It also has way more activity in its atmosphere than you'd suspect, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Both of these planets emit the same amount of heat, even though Uranus is much closer to the Sun. No one knows why. Neptune has extremely strong winds that can reach a speed of up to 1,500 miles per hour. Can they produce this heat? Or maybe it's because of the planet's core or its gravitational force? There's a monster black hole hurtling through space at a speed of 5 million miles per hour. Scientists located it with the Hubble Space Telescope. They believe it weighs as much as a billion suns. It was supposed to stay put in the center of its home galaxy, but some gravitational forces are pushing it around. At one point, this black hole is going to break free from its galaxy and continue roaming the universe. Luckily, it's still 8 billion years away from us. In space, no one can hear you scream. Or is that, in space, no one can hear ice cream? Well, either way, we know that no supernovas, crashing asteroids, and burning planets make a sound in space. Or do they? What if you actually can hear something out there? Well, let's see. Okie dokie, back to middle school. Ahem. Sound is a mechanical way of originating from vibration. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, the simplest example is guitar strings. Let's pluck one of them. It starts to vibrate. The atoms inside the metal string begin to push and beat the atoms of the air around them. So now, atoms are constantly pushing each other until they reach our ears. It's like a wave from a pebble thrown into a pond, and it happens very quickly at a speed of about 761 miles per hour. Then our eardrums begin to vibrate at the same frequency. And the little bones inside our ears transmit this vibration to the brain. The brain then does its magic, recognizes the pattern, and turns it into sounds. Great! Now we know that we need some particles to create sound. And we can find these particles in gases, liquids, and solid substances. And what about space? Nope, it's almost a perfect vacuum. And you've probably already heard that there's no sound in space because it's a vacuum. But what does it actually mean? Well, a vacuum is a perfect void. It's an area completely devoid of matter. It means there's nothing there. Yeah. Despite all those celestial bodies in space, there's actually no air in between them. No atoms, no particles, nothing. Not a zippo. Well, almost. To be honest, the perfect vacuum doesn't really exist. We can't get rid of atoms for good. But space is very close to this notion. On average, there are 15 to 80 atoms per one cubic inch. This may sound like a big number, but keep in mind that these atoms are tiny, and the void distance between them is huge. For comparison, one cubic inch of air contains about 16,000 atoms. So, of course, with such a low density, these atoms can't push each other. Even if the vibration is very strong, like, I don't know, a supernova, they still won't be able to do that. So, movies have been lying to us. All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. If there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder and it would sound deeper. 
So, if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet and transmitted over a very short distance. But it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. We haven't discovered a planet completely made of diamonds yet. But on some planets, it actually rains diamonds. On Jupiter and Saturn, gas giants of our solar system, lightning storms turn abundant methane into soot, which we also know as carbon. The soot falls and transforms into graphite. Further graphite transforms into diamonds with a diameter of about 0.4 inches. Now, Before you start figuring out how to book a diamond-collecting field trip, know that these diamonds don't last. After they enter the planet's core, they melt. Ever notice how when you're stargazing two nights in a row in the same time, let's say 9 p.m., the stars stay in the same place, but the moon doesn't? Well, there are two reasons for that. First, it depends on what time you go stargazing. For instance, if you go outside at 8 p.m. and tomorrow you look for it at 11 p.m., you'll see the moon in two pretty different places. In this case, even the stars take different places in the sky since our planet is spinning. As you know, it takes 24 hours for it to make one full circle. That means, from our point of view, it seems like both the sky and everything up there is just moving around us one time per 24 hours. In the same way, the sun changes its position, rising and setting every day. So, if you went outside two nights in a row at the same hour, in most cases, you'll have to wait for an extra half hour or more until the moon gets back to the same position as the night before. The stars are pretty much standing still. It seems like they're moving, but that's because the Earth is spinning. But the Moon is actually moving around our planet and goes through different phases. For example, a new moon is when it's completely dark in the sky. A full moon is when its day side is facing the Earth. It takes approximately a month for it to finish one circle around the Earth. Maybe you'd be luckier on a diamond-collecting expedition on this next planet, 40 million light-years away from Earth. Scientists used to call it a super-Earth. Now, a super-Earth is generally a planet way bigger than ours. This planet, for example, is double the Earth's size. It's so close to its star that it makes a full circle around it in less than 18 hours, which means a year there is pretty short. Since it's so close to its star, its temperature goes up a whopping 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of the heat, in combination with the planet's density, Scientists have the theory that its core is made of carbon in the form of graphite and diamonds. Over 10 years ago, astronomers discovered a huge water vapor cloud. It was 12 billion light-years from our home planet. That cloud is the biggest source of water we know of. 
It's also the oldest, dating back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. Now it's 13.8 billion years old. Man, if only I had started a savings account 12 billion years ago. With compound interest, I'd have me quite a pile of cash by now. But I wasn't around then. Anyway, this cloud is so large it holds 140 trillion times the amount of water in all the oceans on our planet. This cloud kind of feeds a black hole. It may also contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to encourage the black hole to grow six times bigger than it is at the moment. The average temperature of our planet is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest temperature ever measured was 134 degrees. Sound too hot? Well, on Venus, it can go up to 900 degrees, which makes it the hottest planet in our solar system. It's not hot enough to melt steel, though. It would need to be higher by 2,500 degrees to get there. But it's hot enough to melt lead. And it's way too hot to sustain life, at least not in any form that we know. Venus is not even the closest to the Sun, it's Mercury. But it has a super thick atmosphere that traps greenhouse gases. It's like you covering yourself with a pretty thick blanket in the middle of the summer. Now, we're used to seeing volcanoes spewing hot molten lava. After all, that's what they mostly do on Earth. But in space, volcanoes tend to spew methane, water, or ammonia. And these materials freeze as they erupt and eventually transform into frozen vapor and something called volcanic snow. I'm talking about cryovolcanoes here. You can find them on Jupiter's moons Io and Europa, Saturn's moon Titan, and Pluto. These volcanoes are especially active on Io, which has hundreds of vents. NASA vehicles have even captured some of these erupting in real time. Plumes of frozen vapor coming out of them extended for about 250 miles. Hey, by the way, they just discovered another moon around Jupiter that might actually be good for farming someday. It's named EIEIO. <laughs> now, what exactly happens to the light after it disappears inside of a black hole? Well, photon is a particle of light. The event horizon is the boundary of a black hole. When something, say a photon, crosses the line and enters those boundaries, it can't escape anymore. But it doesn't mean a black hole destroyed it. It pulls the photon in rapidly towards its center, where an enormous mass is packed into an infinitely small space. But we're not sure what happens to photons in such extreme conditions. It's still one of the biggest mysteries. Does a black hole destroy the light or not? Saturn has 82 moons we know about, 53 confirmed and 29 more that are still on the waiting list to be confirmed as actual moons before they get their official names. And one of the coolest moons might be a 914-mile-wide hunk of rock called Aepetus. It's dark on one side and bright on the other. Its lighter half is 20 times more reflective than the other one. As it turned out, the bright side is ice. The dark side is a bit more complicated. One theory says it's dark because of particles coming from another moon, the one named Phoebe. Another theory says it could be because of heat. Since the moon is rotating really slowly, its dark material is absorbing heat, which makes it even darker. Now, how big do you think a black hole can become? In theory, we can't find an upper limit to its mass. But astronomers believe the ultra-massive black holes, or UMBHs, located in the cores of certain galaxies are mostly up to 10 billion solar masses big. Recently, they even discovered these UMBHs physically can't grow much more than this because, in that case, they would start to disrupt the accretion disks that feed them. That way, they would kind of stuff the source of new material. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. The Sun's temperature is hotter than the surface of a star. The surface temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. If someone could dig a tunnel straight into the center of the planet and out the opposite side, and you were adventurous enough to jump into it, it would take you 42 minutes to fall to the other side. You'd speed up as you fell, reaching maximum speed by the time you reached Earth's core. After the halfway point, you would then fall upwards, getting slower and slower. By the time you reach the opposite surface, your speed would be back to zero. 
Unless you manage to climb out of the hole, you'd immediately start falling again, back down or up to the other side of the planet. This trip would go on forever, all thanks to the weird effects of gravity. Hey, might be a fun way to spend an afternoon. There might be more metals, for example, titanium or iron, in lunar craters than astronomers used to think. The main problem with this finding? It contradicts the main theory about how the Moon was formed. That theory says that Earth's natural satellite was spun off from our planet after a collision with a massive space object. But then, why does Earth's metal-poor crust have much less iron oxide than the Moon's? It might mean the Moon was formed from the material lying much deeper inside our planet. Or these metals could have appeared when the molten lunar surface was slowly cooling down. Or maybe, as they've been saying for centuries, it's made of green cheese. Earth could have been purple before it turned blue and green. One scientist has a theory that a substance existed in ancient microbes before chlorophyll, that thing that makes plants green, evolved on Earth. This substance reflected sunlight in red and violet colors, which combined to make purple. If true, the young Earth may have been teeming with strange purple-colored critters before all the green stuff appeared. The highest mountain in the solar system is Olympus Mons on Mars. It's three times as high as Mount Everest, the Earth's highest mountain above sea level. If you were standing on top of Olympus Mons, you wouldn't understand you were standing on a mountain its slopes would be hidden by the planet's curvature. Astronomers have found a massive reservoir of water in space, the largest ever detected. Too bad it's also the farthest, 12 billion light-years away from us. The water vapor cloud holds 140 trillion times as much water as all the Earth's oceans combined. What are we supposed to do with that information? Venus spins at its own unhurried pace. A full rotation takes 243 Earth days, and it takes the planet a bit less than 225 Earth days to go all the way around the Sun. It means a day on Venus is longer than a year. There's very little seismic activity going on inside the Moon. Yet many moonquakes, caused by our planet's gravitational pull, sometimes happen several miles below the surface. After that, tiny cracks and fissures appear in the satellite surface, and gases escape through them. Hey, they sometimes escape from me, too. Now, Mars is the last of the inner planets, which are also called terrestrial since they're made up of rocks and metals. The red planet has a core made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. It's between 900 and 1,200 miles across. The core doesn't move. That's why Mars lacks a planet-wide magnetic field. The weak magnetic field it has is just 1 100th percent of the Earth's. When the planets in the solar system were just starting to form, Earth didn't have a moon for the longest time. It took a hundred million years for our natural satellite to appear. There are several theories as to how the moon came into existence, but the prevailing one is the fission theory. Somebody went fishing and caught the moon? Actually, no. The fission theory proposes that the moon was formed when an object collided with Earth, sending particles flying above. Gravity pulled the particles together, and the Moon was created. It eventually settled down on the Earth's ecliptic plane, which is the path that the Moon orbits. So, looks like the green cheese is off the table now. The largest single living thing on Earth turns out to be a mushroom in Oregon. This enormous honey mushroom lives in Malheur National Forest and covers an area of 3.7 square miles. It could be as much as 8,500 years old. You could be forgiven for missing it, though, since most of it's hidden underground. When the roots of individual honey mushrooms meet, they can fuse together to become a single fungus, which explains how this one got so big. If you could gather all that mushrooming stuff into one big ball, it could weigh as much as 35,000 tons. That's about as heavy as 200 gray whales. Hey, that's a whale of a mushroom. (laughs) Hehe. The largest asteroid in the solar system is called Vesta, and it's so big that it's sometimes even called a dwarf planet. A trip to the nearest star apart from the Sun would take you 5 million years on a commercial airplane. That's what I call a long haul flight. Space isn't supposed to be black, there are stars everywhere. Shouldn't they light up everything around? 
Well, you don't see stars wherever you look because some of them haven't existed long enough for their light to reach Earth. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Now, some scientists believe that our planet used to have an additional satellite. According to their research, a small celestial body about 750 miles wide orbited Earth like a second moon. It most likely crashed into our main satellite later on. Such a collision could explain why the two sides of the moon look so different from each other, one being heavily cratered and rough. Or it could be the green cheese. There's no air on the moon. But then, how can it be rusting? Scientists have discovered the presence of hermatite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks. But without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen. And hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. Even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart, and it will likely result in the formation of a ring around the planet. The Earth is the densest in the solar system. At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile-thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel, but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. Mars houses the biggest volcano in the solar system. While everything seems to be calm on Mars nowadays, in the past, some sort of force caused enormous volcanoes to form and erupt. One of these volcanoes is Olympus Mons. It's 16 miles tall, which is the height of three Mount Everests and 374 miles across, making it about the size of Arizona. The volcano grew to such a gargantuan size because of the weak gravity on Mars and the lack of tectonic plate movement. Gravity is not the same everywhere. The rocks, metals, and other minerals and substances that make up the planet are packed into the ground more tightly in certain places than in others. This has surprising consequences. Gravity varies slightly depending on where you are. You weigh 0.5% less standing at the equator than you do at the poles. In most cases, that's a difference of less than one pound. How high up you are also has an effect. So if you were at the top of Mount Everest, you'd also weigh slightly less. Just don't look down. Earth's toughest living thing is so small, you can't see it. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, are cute little creatures with eight legs and squashed up heads that are less than a hundredth of an inch in length. Despite their microscopic stature, they can basically survive anywhere. They prefer bits of wet moss or the bottom of a lake, but they won't complain if you put them somewhere really uncomfortable. They can endure extreme cold and incredible heat and survive both huge pressure and high radiation. Some of the little bears once even managed to survive unprotected in outer space for 10 days without a problem. Huh, that is tough. They handle all these things by rolling up into a ball and hibernating, which reduces their need for oxygen and food. 
The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would also be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet, inside a heavy spacesuit, would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. You can see solar eclipses because even though the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, it's also 400 times closer to Earth. So it's perfectly capable of obscuring the star. But in 50 million years, I won't be around then. The moon won't be able to block the sun completely because of the satellite's changing orbit. A full NASA spacesuit costs an unbelievable $12 million. Yeah, I can believe that. 70% of this hefty sum is for the control module and backpack. At the very center of Uranus, there's a rocky core. Small, just half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, Uranus's core is rather cool. 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice mantle surrounds the solid core, and that's the largest portion of the planet, about 80%. It's also not the ice you might be thinking about. It's a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia, ice, and methane, sometimes referred to as a water-ammonia ocean. Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it has its blue-green color because of methane gas that absorbs the red light. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other in the solar system. But unlike Earth's oceans, it's made not of water, but of metallic hydrogen. The ocean's depth is a mind-blowing 25,000 miles. That's almost the same as the distance around Earth. Venus is a champ when it comes to volcanoes. The planet has about 1,600 major ones, but none of them is known to erupt. There's a supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from us. It hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's 57 octaves lower than the middle C on your piano. That's one quadrillion times deeper than what we can hear. Mercury is a few billion years old. In 2016, Scientists discovered some abnormalities on the planet's surface, showing that it's getting smaller. After more research, they found out that Mercury hadn't finished cooling down yet. There are planets that aren't bound to any star orbit and aimlessly wander through outer space. Among the most spectacular-looking space objects are pulsars. Pulsars are a type of neutron star. They shoot out some of their material almost at the speed of light. Regular pulsars spin at a reasonable speed, between one-tenth to sixty times per second. But millisecond pulsars can spin at an impressive seven hundred times a second, which is way too fast for the human eye to even process. As they spin, they emit a beam of radiation from their axis that looks like the light from a lighthouse. Astronomers can notice pulsars when they face Earth, since it looks like a light being shined on our planet. When the light shines elsewhere, the pulsar can't be seen. Astronomers know for sure that the universe is growing bigger, and the speed at which it's ballooning is increasing all the time. But if the whole thing is swelling into something bigger, then it must have some kind of an edge, right? It's unlikely that people will ever find out, but if so, then what would it be? A ginormous brick wall and then nothing? An abyss that leads to nowhere? The most common theory is that the universe is shaped in such a way that it can't have an edge. But it's not the only idea. Another theory is even more difficult to comprehend. The universe is, indeed, infinite. And our part of it isn't that unique. It means that somewhere out there, there's another you. Or rather, other you. One of them is just a bit shorter. Another wears their hair in a different way. And the third one is identical to you in all possible ways. There's also a theory about a multi-universe that consists of many smaller universes. 
and the universe we live in is just a tiny bubble among other similar bubbles. Those scientists who support this idea are also sure that bubble universes can come into contact with one another. Then gravity starts to flow between them, and when two or three universes connect, a big bang occurs, just like the one that created our home universe. Neptune is the windiest place in the solar system. Clouds of frozen methane are whipped across the planet at a speed of 1,200 miles per hour. Neptune's core is solid and consists mostly of iron and some other metals. Its mass is 1.2 times bigger than that of Earth. The temperature inside reaches 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers also believe that at a depth of 4,500 miles, there might be a diamond layer where it's raining diamond crystals. On Earth, people are used to a beautiful sunset that's painted in hues of orange, red, and yellow. On Mars, however, the normally pinkish red sky turns blue as the sun goes down under the horizon. It's because Mars is much farther away from the sun than Earth, making the sunlight less intense. The fine dust in the Martian atmosphere absorbs the blue light and gets rid of the warmer colors that you typically see on Earth. Whether it's blue or yellow, both sunsets look spectacular. At around a quarter of the size of Earth, the moon is pretty enormous relative to other satellites out in space. There's nothing quite like this situation anywhere else in the solar system. Pluto has a moon that's almost half as big as itself, but it's more like a twin than a satellite. There are more than 150 moons in our solar system, and Earth's is the fifth largest out of the whole lot. There might be a labyrinth of lava tubes on the moon. Not long ago, astronomers received the results of an underground lunar topography. They discovered a massive cave under the satellite's surface. About 30 miles long and 60 miles wide, the cave's likely to be the result of 3 billion year old volcanic activity. After streams of lava hardened, they created a thick hard crust on the outside. But inside, lava kept flowing, melting the rock, and forming tunnels and caves. Countless pits in the moon's surface discovered by NASA might be the openings to lava tubes. We can't dig up most of Earth's gold. 99% of it ended up in the center of the planet several billion years ago, attracted by the iron in Earth's core. We're talking about 1.6 quadrillion tons of gold here. That's enough to coat the entire planet's surface in 1.5 feet of the stuff. And if all those meteorites hadn't later smashed into the ground, bringing extra amounts of gold, it would be even rarer. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a massive blob of some mysterious substance. It was hidden underneath the surface of the moon's far side. Its mass was the same as that of a pile of metal five times larger than the big island of Hawaii. The enigmatic something lies almost 200 miles beneath an enormous crater that appeared on the lunar surface billions of years ago. The blob likely has something to do with a super collision. It might be the metal core of the object that hit the moon back then. Scientists can't wait to lay their hands on the discovery. It could explain lots of things about the South Pole Aitken crater, the largest known in the solar system. If it was on Earth, its oval-shaped basin would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Texas. In 2011, astronomers discovered an enormous water reservoir simply floating in space around a supermassive black hole called a quasar. Floating water vapors have been found throughout the universe, but they aren't that common. This particular reservoir holds around 140 trillion times the amount of water in the Earth's oceans. It's one of the oldest, largest, and, at more than 12 billion light-years away, one of the farthest things known to humankind. Astronauts in space can lose about 1% of their muscle mass each month. To prevent this, they have to stick to an exercise regimen that lasts two hours every single day. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are going to meet in 3.75 billion years. They're moving toward each other at a breakneck speed. When the two galaxies collide, they'll form a huge elliptical galaxy. I won't be around then. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.